read it in here, but like while I was doing it, I like reflected on all the people that brought me to where I'm at now and like where I want to be. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, exercises like that kind of do that for you. One other person, want to share something special that you put on that newspaper? I guess I went to like the more personal route, but mm -hmm. Right. Did you guys see um, any kind of presence of any of those eight strategies when you created this? Did you feel, obviously it was a tell your story piece, but did you see any trends or patterns kind of from past to present and maybe your future goals as far as um, what you have accomplished or want to accomplish? Do you see any common themes there? Anybody want to share if they saw that? I see you not nodding, Maddie. <laughs> I think it's like really similar how you have goals that you want to like reach, and even if you have like accomplished those from like high school to college, you kind of have those same expectations like going on to your future. Mm -hmm. I know like whenever I was writing it, I was thinking like, oh, I was feeling this way about stuff I've already accomplished since college, like when I was in high school. So like writing down future goals or whatever is kind of what I did, and it was just. Uh, interesting like the similarity that you feel with that as you did those things you've accomplished. Right. Well, I hope this exercise kind of, and we're going to come back to this. I'm going to have you guys bring them up before we start the film and then get your um, worksheet for today's um, assignment. But I hope this kind of helped you do some self reflection on maybe providing you some clarity for your vision and, you know, in that process of understanding yourself to seeing what your life kind of looks like. What are these highlight moments that stand out to you in reference to your visions? And then we'll come back to this when we talk about values. So you guys, if you could just make sure your name is somewhere on there outside of just your headline, make sure your name is on there and just bring it up. And then as you come up, grab one of these worksheets. So as you guys can see on this worksheet, today we are going to talk about Dan West. How many of y'all are familiar with Heifer International? Any of y'all heard about of that organization? Heifer, Inter I feel like my mask is like super tight today. Heifer International, have any of you heard of it? So Heifer International, and I'm not going to go too deep into it because this whole film is about Dan West and he's a really incredible leader who had the philosophy that people didn't just want to be unsuccessful and live in poverty. They maybe need some resources so they can help themselves. So um, Dan West will be the leader that we highlight to really understand vision. So as you see on this worksheet, you're going to want to describe his personal vision and his leadership vision. Remember, those two are different, but the leadership vision um, is a part of your personal vision, right? So you want to make sure you guys can have your book out as you work on this. So you want to uh, describe that. And then when it says, where are, was there a congruency of direction? It gives you the page numbers to find kind of that language. But when we talk about congruency, it's just 
making sure or there is there some overlap and intersect between his leadership vision and his personal vision. And this film is just, he's really a remarkable human, but it's a really, um, he get, they give very clear examples on how he personally felt and how that, how that translated into his leadership. So this is front and back. So you wanna make sure you answer these questions through the film, throughout the film, and then when we um, finish the film, we'll discuss this worksheet. Okay, any questions? Over. 
with all the livestock, of course, that had lost in, in the Civil War, or in Canada, or started milk supply. So Dan went to the people he knew best, his fellow Church of the Brethren members, Methodists, Mennonites, Amish, neighbors, mostly farmers, in northern Indiana. Went with my dad to, uh, to this rally, and Dan was, was the speaker. He'd just come back from Spain from doing the relief work for the church over there, and he was telling how it would have been sure great if he could, could bring them some heifers. And they could take care of them and have their milk, have their own source of milk. And as I understand it, although we don't have any verification, uh, my father made the motion that, it, that the project be accepted as a project of the men of the district of North Indiana. And uh, at, at that same meeting, then uh, Virgil Mock said that he would donate the first heifer. And so my father said, well, okay, we would raise the first heifer. And so that's a picture we have of, of, uh, of Virgil delivering the heifer his faith to our fault. And uh, soon after, there were uh, two more heifers coming. Uh, and so mother, my mother named the faith over charity. The idea spread with, us, with very little promotion, or very little effort. And uh, in fact, they had accumulated uh, Ship remember for Spain at a time when the when they were the ship of the Spain because the Civil War two Civil War or two had broken out. So 1844, those first cattle were sent to Puerto Rico, where the Church of the Brethren had been operating a hospital in the small isolated community of Castanier. Castaner at that time was considered one of the poorest rural areas in Puerto Rico. They had no milk. Not enough cows, enough to fill a hospital, so they were using powdered milk and also in the clinics. Seven or eight, I forgot the exact thing, were taken to Castanera. British milk for the hospital. The idea caught hold and farmers began donating cattle by the hundreds for villages in need around the world, especially war devastated Europe. That same year, the Church of the Brethren adopted the Pepper Project as an official program of the church. Ben Bushong convinced the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency, along with the U.S. government, to help with the cost of shipping the animals. They agreed to provide shipping space for all the animals that have a project provided. The sea boys got $150 to make the month-long trip by boat to take the cattle and other animals to Europe. As soon as the uh, end of the, the war permitted us, the war was over and permitted us to ship cattle to Europe, uh, it made it easy. Ship cattle to uh, countries that were most devastated. Poland was, was extremely devastated, so it was one of the major outlets for help. I was so uh, surprised, in a way, the uh, evidence of the destructiveness of war as our ship moved into the harbor of the heartland, even from the distance. Most of the buildings in the harbor area had been leveled, some maybe still partially. And this was the job involved keeping the animals fed and clean, and if any of the livestock had already given birth, milking them. It was just the day to day grind of getting the uh, uh, hay and, uh, out of the holes down under them and lugging uh, that around to uh, all, all the horses and then cleaning it up afterwards. It, it, was, it was hard work. Don Snyder spent three years in Europe mm -hmm. working with the distribution of cattle and horses. The people put their arms right around the cows, you know, they, they were particularly uh, pleased to get a whole cow. The cows, uh, for some of those families, were a lifesaver for them. West had another idea, which ran hand in hand with sending cattle to areas of need. In order to receive a heifer, the recipient had to promise to pass <coughs> on the firstborn offspring to someone else who was also in need. A recipient, in turn, became a donor. We told them they just take care of it, and the first half born, they were supposed to give it to another family. That, that's all it was, that simple. People were inclined to cooperate because if they didn't want to be upon receiving it, they also wanted to be a donor, in, in many cases. And it, it gave them a certain pride to be able to give something to somebody else. 
By the late 40s, Heifer Project had gone ecumenical, adding other denominational partners to the board, as more and more people wanted to help poor people to become self-reliant, which was really Dan's vision. Heifers were soon joined by goats, sheep, chickens, bees, even red wiggle worms for vermiculture. And Heifer expanded and to include community development. In-country staff worked with local organizations, helping them better their own communities, always under the umbrella of passing on a gift from one person, one family to another. Fred Harder worked with Heifer Project for 30 years with the Dominican Republic and Guatemala. In Guatemala, I saw six generations passed on from the same animal, from the offspring going on and on. And from what I hear now, they are still working and passing on the gift. So it's a, a, a unique program. So when we try to do it, organize local groups, community self-help groups, or whatever they call themselves, and they select their own, we call it board of directors, and then they decide who gets an animal or who gets the offspring. The genius that uh, Dan was that, you know, we get people working together, they're going to improve uh, their situation through their, through their effort. But development is not, not something that you bring from the outside, it's something that you have to get people to do for themselves. So, you, so stimulating kind of a community process, I think that's what it was all about. But sending heifers to people in need was hardly an end in itself for Dan West. It was a byproduct attitude that revolved around doing something for the cause of peace. And everywhere he went, his message was the same. The church, God's people, needed to be doing more for peace. He believed that, the, especially the Church of the Brethren, needed to take seriously their uh, ideal, their theology of pacifism. He really uh, felt that he, uh, he had a personal mandate to be a peacemaker. And uh, he wanted to take that message because he had the position to do it as youth director and as Christian educator with our denomination. That That's in his job description, to work at bridging these groups of people with the brethren theology, pacifism, no war. There's another way to solve conflict. During the 1940s, one of his jobs with the Church of the Brethren denomination was working with youth. He had an extraordinary ability to relate to young people. And when they would meet, he would challenge them. He was the kind of person who could inspire particularly young people. He had a way of uh, really focusing, concentrating on a person. When you're talking to him, you had the idea that you were the most important person in the world for him at that time, which may have been true. By the time the Church's Brethren met in 1948 for its annual conference, lots of the youth, clearly influenced by their interaction with Dan through the years, had become restless. The Church had taught them to say no to war, but wasn't giving them sufficient uh, place or opportunity to say in, to service and to peace. And in part it came out of the Peace Caravan movement, which Dan was very instrumental in starting where a group of people would go around, the young people would go around from church to church and talk peace and preach and work with the young people. Uh, but it, then it came to, to the annual conference and some of these same people said, what we need to do is to get a kind of a volu voluntary service, a volunteer service, which was the kind of thing that, that Dan had promoted way back in the 30s. Well, was their proposal to start a volunteer program for young people was not part of the conference business agenda that year. We knew that there was enough enthusiasm for this. And see, so, um, so when we got ready to take it, then we decided, well, we need to get this to the floor some way. Then we had to go, well, who do we talk to? So good old Dan, you know, he's the one you go to because, you know, he knows everybody. And we wanted him to do it. And he says, no. He said, we're not, I'm not going to do this. This is, you young, do this. So, and he said, well, you've got to get a hold of the moderator. You know, he, and of course it would be a new business. The rules of conference said that uh, we'd have to wait another year. But uh, the young people didn't want to wait another year. And we were under considerable amount of pressure from not only the youth, but from several of the adult leaders to allow it to come to conference and suspend the rules. We were all quite favorable with the idea because uh, we realized it was Second World War, there was a tremendous need in Europe for um, service of all kinds, 
and the young people were anxious to pro be provided with this kind of service. So the youth took the unprecedented step of proposing to the assembled gathering a new initiative, which would be called Brethren Volunteer Service. Fifty years later, at the church gathering in Orlando, Florida, that historic motion was reenacted. This young man, Ted Chambers, only four foot ten inches tall, brought an arm to stand on and made the motion to start a volunteer program for youth. It was for us. It's for the favor. And so then when they brought to, to the book one, it just passed unanimous. And it was just such a high feeling about the young people just all cheered. Well, you know, and everybody, after that happened, everybody thought, well, how did, we, how did, that, how did that come from? You know, it was just like a ball game almost. You know, it was just such a high moment. And after conference was over that afternoon, everybody was talking about what a wonderful thing that was. So beginning in night, groups of church of brother and youth, later people of all ages and church affiliations, even those without church affiliation, fanned out into the world to give of themselves in service, something for which Dan West had carefully laid the groundwork. For seven years, Dan's daughter, Jan West Schrock, directed PBS. He talked about the little people. He, he talked about youth. He loved to work with young people. And the little people in Dad's mind were uh, people who maybe weren't educated, sophisticated, or they weren't in, um, uh, they weren't in positions of power. They might be farmers. Uh, people of the land would be little people. Um, and he loved them. He, he was an advocate for, for bringing their consciousness up. That, that's what excited him. For more than 50 years, BBS has allowed those little people to make contributions for the cause of peace by working in human need, advocating justice for the oppressed, doing active peacemaking, the kinds of things Dan thought were at the heart of carrying out Christ's message. For many years, Dan was involved in helping to train the volunteers during their three or four week orientation. Most of his time, he was held at the Brethren Service Center in New Windsor, Maryland. There, he was able to do what he did best, get people to think outside the box. Yeah, we have the first week usually pretty good because he's one of the best leaders in the group. And the first week was a lot of lectures, a lot of small groups. He was a very kind person, and it's all spoken but excellent in leading discussions, pulling people, questions out of people, and getting the discussion out. Among the people Dan West liked to engage in discussions was Vernon Schwalm, the president of Manchester College, where Dan had been graduated. Manchester was affiliated with the Church of the Brethren. He was constantly asking, what are we doing in the peace studies program? And this was right after World War II. So everybody was concerned about the mood, you know, the mood in the country was to do something to try to bring about a more peaceful world. So the, the atmosphere was right, and Dan was, my guess is, <laughs> knowing Dan as I did, that he was needling people, saying, let's get at this, let's, let's do something about it. President Schwalm's reaction was to invite Gladys Muir, a professor from California, to develop a program for the study of peace that would be taught in Manchester. Initially, she turned him down. But he knew Dan was going to be back at his door anyway. So he invited Dan to teach course at the college. Um, and the course was something like a basis for an enduring peace. Dan came and taught that course in 47. The next year, 1948, Gladys Muir changed her mind and came to Manchester to set up the first college-level peace studies program in the nation. Today, Manchester College's peace studies program sends out graduates trained to work at peace-related issues all around the world. Our denomination has been known primarily as uh, one of the historic peace churches. And I think this program is the academic expression of it. Both came out of the same tradition of concern for peacemaking. Uh, it's at the heart of the gospel. I think Dan sensed that. And, uh, reconciliation, expression of uh, love for others as God loves us. Like other initiatives linked to Dan West, his role was primarily as visionary. Others actually set it up and made it work, but he provided the idea and the motivation. I think Schwann's reaction to Dan was, I i to do something because if I go, he's going to be at my door again. 
He's going to come back again. He, he, pers he persevered. I mean, he was persistent um, and did not give up lightly on anything. And um, so I think he would have been back. Dan West didn't have to work quite as hard to sell the idea of sending heifers overseas. All of his visions came out of who he was and what he experienced. A man following the teachings of Christ and practicing a simple, uncluttered life. For Dan West, the simple life and peace walked hand in hand. He believed in the simple life and he lived a simple life. I made a train trip with him from Chicago to Orlando, Florida. Uh, and I thought I'd die in the process of that trip because he didn't believe in eating any meals in the dining car, you know, he thought. And we would just, if there was a stop on the railroad, we'd run in and get cheese and crackers and a bit of milk, and that was, that was the meal. And for three days, you know, that, that's a little, if you're used to food, that's, that's hard to take, but, but that was Dan. Louis Raymond remembers Dan telling a youth gathering that included Dan's son, Phil, yeah. that kids those days probably had too many clothes in their closets talking about the problems of the world and the difference in our materialism, and he said, you girls, how many pairs of shoes do you have, he asked. And uh, we were sort of counting them up in our head, and he said, I want you to give half of them away, the better half. And then he asked all the guys, and how many pairs of pants do you have? And so they were counting them up in their head, and he said, I want you to give half of your pants away, and as I recall, we all laughed because his son said, oh, there goes my other pair of pants, which touched us because their whole family lived out what he believed, and we could see it there. I think when we grew up as kids, we really did think about the hungry children of the world. Um, so that when we were had to eat everything and, and clean up and all that, I, I think we believed that. Dan's most famous line about not eating cake people who are still hungry seemed irrational to some, but pointed to the core of what he believed. We were invited to the home of the uh, local pastor, and his wife had really worked very hard and very nice meal, and so at the end of this, uh, she came out and it was beautiful cake. And she was really chagrined when Dan said, you know, true to his conviction, I'm sorry, but I can't accept cake when the people you know, she had knocked herself out to be the most generous, bountiful hostess. And here, you know, it seemed like he was affronting her with that. Uh, and it, it, was a, it was an awkward situation, but you know, he, he believed that, and he practiced that, even if it did offend some people. He was very pleasant about it. He was, and he didn't harangue them or criticize her for doing that. He just politely said, you know, I, I cannot accept this one when I know that others are really starving. He was guided by his conviction, and uh, that was pretty solid. Uh, you know, whether it was turning down an award or uh, uh, living uh, simply, uh, not eating cake, uh, 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 voicing, uh, speaking for the, uh, the downtrodden, uh, I think he was true to, you know, that's who he was, and uh, it's important that he conveyed that. Turning down an award, Health was something he did twice to his alma mater, Manchester College, which had wanted to give him an honorary doctor for his work. But his response on that one was uh, uh, that, that he didn't want to do anything that would uh, would be, divide him from the little people, as he talked, which meant uh, laying on the mothers in the church. That was in 1960. Some five years later, Dan was elected the first for being moderator of the Church of the Brethren. And the college thought it was time to make the offer again. I thought that then I'd given up on uh, his anti-establishmentism when he became moderator, which is about as establishment as you can get in the Church of the Brethren. But Dan listed ten reasons why he wanted to decline. His identification with the local community, living near relatives and on the land, was the reason he kept his family in northern Indiana and the rest of it staff lived at the headquarters in Elgin, Illinois. 
He clearly disliked the bureaucratic environment. The world was made up of two kinds of people. You had big shots and little people. And uh, Dad definitely was on the side of the little people. And I think it carried underneath a kind of sort of Christian socialism. You know, again, this egalitarian idea. He was, he was very down on bureaucrats. And perhaps, as you know, that was what I think he faced throughout his life, was working with even church bureaucrats. For Dan West, being a church bureaucrat was a necessary evil was through the bureaucracy that he was able to advocate for what he wanted the church to do, even though he also advocated through his meeting with people around the country. We thought he was away from the home too much. He was on the road all the time, and very popular, district meetings, wherever they could locate him. His wife, Lucy, whom he married when he was old, managed to keep the family going while Dan traveled around the church, sometimes four to five months out of a year. Lucy West was a model of graciousness and generosity and patience and tolerance <laughs> and was heaven hope and marvelous support for him. He couldn't, with, without her and the way she ran the home and the family, he could have done it. Dan remained focused on his work for the church, some would say, to the detriment of his own health and family life motivating others was his passion. He loved getting people um, to do stuff. He loved to organize that and pick up the phone and go visit people and talk to them. And, what about this, John? What's your thinking on this? Um, well, what, what's your ideas? And he, he, he was, I think he was really calling out people's higher level thinking skills. Uh, that's why people, little people, that's why they loved him. Because uh, he, he, invited, he invited them to, to think higher. So the standards were, were always very high. And um, sometimes it, it, was, it was a struggle, and it, sometimes it was heavy. We still carry that. I mean, it's a kind of a, it's not a burden. It's kind of a mandate, you know, that, that this is what we need to do is to be to look out, to reach across, and to become aware, and above all, to the people who are hungry. <coughs> I still feel very, very deep, more than a half century later. So too do the ever-growing number of people all around the world whom Dan has touched, however indirectly, by his vision of how people who call themselves followers of one could act. It was not even to convert people to this particular faith. I feel a very deep, uh, sincere religious position. But I think uh, if it came down to feeding somebody or uh, converting them, he would go and feed somebody. What Dan did want to do was convince those who were already Christian, especially his own people, the Church of the Brethren, to follow Christ more faithfully, to identify with the disadvantaged people of the world, common people of society, as Jesus had done. Heifers very nicely fit into that philosophy. Heifers are raised not by bureaucrats, they're raised by little people, common people. And the recipients are also common people. And those common people, little people, become good people when they pass on the gift. It's so simple, isn't it? You know, but I, I think that's what I think that's what kept this fire going. For me it's very so but it's just something that makes also just a lot of good common sense. I mean just sort of like who wants to just be you know all the recipients, you know, what a wonderful thing to think of the poor. Yeah, I hear this so many times, you know, I am able to help somebody else. You know, I am able to do for somebody else. But that's, that, that itself is so, so empowering to people. I, those are the kind of things that I think of, you know, in terms of Dan's legacy that he gave to, to the world, really. He was helping people at the grassroots because he'd been there personally. And he wanted to be more sustainable than just a day or a week or even a year. And so he put this into play. It was so successful because people in this country were part of it. They gave their own resources. Their set, they even accompanied the animals, you know, at that time. What ownership. Heifers put uh, flesh on the bones of peace. Okay, it was real. It worked. Um, it was dynamic. 
It was alive. It was not an abstraction. No one who was around Dan West would ever have described him as abstract, or vague, or indecisive, or uncertain. His beliefs were well formed, his positions skillfully articulated. M. R. Ziegler, who worked alongside Dan on the denominational staff, gave the eulogy at Dan West's memorial service. His imagination was tremendous. He was hard to live with, Peter. He was always so big. Because I was an administrator, and I saw the people in the churches, and how much they do or they wouldn't do. Dan couldn't see that, even when he saw the distance. Where are we going? He had a unique way of going around, kind of creeping around here and there. He never knew where he was going up, or what he was going to say, or what he was going to propose. But when it's all said, uh, that's a good man to work with. It's hard on it, but you're always alive. Dan West are not only still alive, but are thriving. Through the highly successful development work of Pepper International in more than a hundred countries across the globe. Through students who are pursuing lives and careers in peacemaking at Manchester College. Through the years of service given by men and women who have been a part of Brethren Volunteer Service. And through his own understanding of Christian discipleship that took up the cause of the hungry and the poor. He challenged untold numbers of people he came in contact with. A lifetime of church and camp work with that vision. And many of them passed it on to their children, as he had done. The simple idea of passing on gifts, one to another, that now reaches across the world, was modeled by Dan West himself, through a legacy of giving, service, and peacemaking. What are some thoughts? First, who is, who is Dan West? What did he do? He watched whole movie. So what exactly did he accomplish? And not necessarily specific answers from the, the worksheet, just literally what did he accomplish? What did he do so significant to where we're spending time today in class to talk about him? Mm -hmm. Yeah, explain that. So. How, how did he go about trying to make sure everybody had the opportunity to be self-sufficient? Um, he tried to give them the basic resources to life and then asked them, you know, once they kind of like got their stuff together to help other people do the same. Mm -hmm. Through the passing of cows through communities internationally and so passionate about it that he wanted to make sure everybody could feed themselves and saw that there was a lot of other layers there to why people can't feed themselves. It's not just because people are lazy and don't want to. So how about I break you guys off into some <coughs> groups today, um, kind of make it to where you guys will be a big group. Y'all are kind of already in a circle. And remember, it's front and back worksheet. You'll turn these in today. Then I'll have you guys kind of in a group. Braylon, I'll talk with you. And then you guys will be a little small group. So what I want you guys to do is talk through these questions. And then we'll break off or we'll break off back kind of into class and talk about it as a class. Make sure you've answered all the questions. If you kind of had trouble or want to add some more to it, like just form your own discussions and work through a few of these questions, okay? So I'm going to give you guys about, probably about five minutes or so to do that. Yeah, of course. <laughs>
about two more minutes. So I might have to take something off. <laughs> After watching, I, know, I, I mean, I watch them every semester I teach this, but it's just like, I'm inspired. I mean, I eat cake. I, I don't pass up on cake, you know? <laughs> right, right, exactly. I know. I was Uh, philanthropy thing, and I don't know if that's really? a local thing, but yeah. that was ours. So I didn't know if that was like. No, like that's mm -hmm. all, like in my, uh, the Hepburn National Park. My sister and my brother did that, mm -hmm. and, but I've never heard of Dan West ever. No. Mm -hmm. Never. Wow, that's crazy. But you know, it kind of goes to kind of the person he is, like yeah. being so. You don't want to be like no. Exactly. Actually, get catalogs every single year and like really? and buy a chicken or something. <laughs> okay, y'all. Let's take some time to talk about Dan West. So, you guys, I'm going to kind of go through, like we did Tuesday, go through each group and let you guys talk about it, okay? So, the first question What was Dan West's personal vision? I'll start with this group here in the center. Surprise. So, what was Dan West's personal? First of all, what is a personal vision? Let's review that. Yes, your personal roles you are you have in your life, um, your your kind of your family, your personal aspirations, those things. So, what was Dan West's personal vision? He wanted to work for peace, serve the younger and less experienced, and spread the Bible. Okay. Live with like only what he needed and not excessively. Yes, he was a very modest man wanted to like you say live with what he actually had but give away other things he didn't necessarily need to help serve the greater good okay so what was his leadership vision i'll ask this group over here what was dan west's leadership vision well first what is a leadership vision it's like what you <coughs> want to achieve as a leader like what you want 
Yeah, kind of like your personal aspirations as a leader, maybe your personal professional goals as a leader is very specific to just your professional life. Okay? What was Dan West's leadership vision? We, we kind of like came to a conclusion that it was basically that he gave, served, and made peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, just kind of like all the things that in one like sense that he basically did for everyone. Right. So what kind of... Um, what kind of areas did he focus his career to be able to do that? Uh, he really like centered things around the church and being able to teach people like how to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> the thing that really got me was like how sustainable his vision was. Like mm -hmm. especially with the Ever International, like with the first offspring going to someone else in need, like mm -hmm. that sustainability was really cool to me. Right. Right, so his, his leadership vision really tied into his work with Heifer International and in trying to make sure that people had that opportunity to um, build their village and, and feed their families. So he also had kind of the vision within the church because he had those leadership roles in the church to make sure that Christians walk the walk and talk the talk. So um, leads us to kind of our next question I'll ask you guys over here, the congruency element. So was there congruency of direction between Dan West's leadership vision and his personal vision? So his personal vision we talked about was really just kind of his Christian beliefs, um, maybe kind of how he valued how people should treat each other, peace. Those are his personal, um, some elements of his personal vision. His leadership vision was what he saw um, how he could use agriculture as a way and through cattle to help people be able to provide food for their communities and move it down from you know family to family to family so where is the congruency piece where is there overlap between his personal vision and his leadership vision Pepper International providing ways for people to become self-reliant and then like in his personal life like not eating cake or like giving up half their clothing to one another so really they both kind of intersected in this idea of like giving back to people in need. Right so it was a consistent of if you saw um, things in his leadership vision that he's written down so kind of thinking about that back to your newspaper Surely you probably wrote some things about your leadership vision in there, I would hope, and then also some things from your personal vision. So seeing if they are congruent. If I'm saying I, I really in, enjoy something um, professionally, but you're, like I kind of used that example before, of maybe, you know, maybe say I really value not littering. I think we should really have um, a healthier environment, but you see me driving down I 35 and I'm throwing like a, you know, a slushy out the window. I just, you know, like you're just like, okay, are you really? Do you really care? Because my personal values, maybe, are that I'm in a rush and I and it's convenient to do something like that. But is that really in alignment with my overall goal as a sustainable environment? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad person, but it means that you want to make sure your personal aspect is in alignment with that leadership vision. Because remember it the personal vision encompasses that leadership vision so you would hope that it's not completely different okay number four this three it has been said that effectiveness in leadership begins with vision how did dan west's story demonstrate this quote i think it's honestly just like the whole movie kind of supported that like he had a vision he had a goal and he did his best to obtain it so uh, being like an effective leader and showing others like how to be self-sufficient and everything I think is how uh, like he did that with his vision was just making sure everyone continued to be a better like human and be a better version mm -hmm. of themselves yes and I think too in addition to that is just his ability to inspire the youth um, it was a quote from one of the gentlemen in the film of just saying that you know he was able to kind of provide ideas and motivation for them it wasn't necessarily he wanted to he needed to implement those things 
but he had the drive to really push these people to see the vision through. And even when he had the um, students go before, just really kind of um, standing up and saying they wanted that opportunity. So just making sure that his vision is articulated clearly. Surely if all those youth were able to kind of execute plans, all these chapters, um, well, not really chapters, but different kind of projects popping up in different countries established by Heifer International, surely there is some clarity in that vision to be able, for multiple people in different countries to be able to execute something. So the next question, this group over here, how did Dan West's leadership vision meet the three requirements of leadership vision? So first, what were the three requirements of leadership vision we talked about on Tuesday? Guys, remember? The three requirements of a leadership vision. What must it do? Incorporate your dreams and passions. Yes. Yes. So number one, it, can, it incorporates your dreams and passions. Number two, it continues to evolve. And then number three, it is authentic. It's true to who you are. So how did Dan West's leadership vision demonstrate those three areas? Well, like we said that it always like grew, like his leadership vision always grew, like it never stayed the same when he did the heifer and then he wanted to grow in the church, so it always grew. Mm -hmm. Right. From just starting, from just going overseas and seeing the destruction to where it came, where the... Um, where the organization came and how he was able to impact you, that was tremendous evolution over time. And even how he decided how he wanted to kind of interact in different spaces, that shifted over time as he became more aware of the problems that were present in the world. Okay? Number six, were Dan West's actions aligned with his words? Did he walk the walk or walk the talk? Give an example. I, I think he probably walked the walk, um, just considering that there's a quote in the movie that's about how he's not going to eat that cake when there's people that are starving and that don't have bread. Um, so I think that he kind of stuck true to his values and, you know, stuck true to what he was working towards the entire time and that's what he wanted to do, that's what he wanted to do. I mean, personally, I don't understand, like, the difference between if you have the opportunity to eat it, then I guess you should, but at the same time, I think think he stuck to his values so much that uh, it never left him that he did the right thing and I think he walks the walk instead of talks the talk. So. Right. Yeah. Anything else you want to add on that? Um, there's also a quote from one of the men who spoke that said like he believed in the simple life and he lived the simple life, mm -hmm. like the story of them on the train and like he denying like to eat a meal in there instead of just stopping at like a store if they have a chance to right. get crackers and cheese and just eating that the whole time they traveled. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't even know if I've encountered a human that disciplined in, in their vision to, to be, I mean, because I know I, I, I see things and I feel guilty and I maybe stop for a while or something that maybe isn't the best decision, but it's not the discipline that he demonstrated throughout his life where multiple people are around him. This is one thing I always tell my son, like, the important thing about leadership is when you do the right thing when no one's watching, you know, and, and I think that he was one of those people, it seems if you caught him anywhere, you would probably catch him doing the right thing, which really spoke to kind of his integrity. Also, another part is just when they talked about the better half, when they talked about when um, he was meeting with you and asking them, you know, how many shoes do you have? Okay, great, give away half of them and make sure it's the better half. So just always wanting to um, kind of provide for others that may need it more than you do. So I'll open this one up to the entire class, the last two. So someone tell me, you know, from the strategies for discovering your leadership vision, the eight that we talked about, um, but the specific one of incorporate lessons from role models. What lesson <laughs> could you incorporate from Dan West? that sometimes to become a leader you have to put others above yourself to achieve a greater good yes put others first and you saw how passionate those people who followed him were 
when that was happening, when he when they saw he was noble. What else? I said that he was inviting to all kinds of people. It didn't matter like if he didn't know him or even if maybe he didn't like him. And I know like for me, like if I don't like you, I'm probably not gonna like invite you in here. <laughs> right, right. But like, yeah, like just everybody was equal. There was no difference in how he treated people. And there was also no difference in what he expected from others either. Absolutely. One other thing that you guys can take away from Dan West. I just really uh, put the main thing I took away from Dan is uh, how he continued to like rely on his faith. I felt like that was like the center of everything he did. Like it all came from that. He was just like really focused on that. He just kind of like carried through what he was doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. He used um, the Bible to structure his behavior. So he felt as though he was doing things that was maybe bigger than himself. And he allowed that to guide. Like um, one of the gentlemen did say that is that kind of his faith guided him in his vision. So for the last question is, what other role models could you look, at, look into trying to discover your own leadership vision? Provide at least three, but I want to hear one from somebody. One leader that, or one role model that you do not know that you feel like you could incorporate some of their leadership vision into yours or personal vision into yours. Matthew McConaughey. Who? Matthew McConaughey. Okay, why Matthew McConaughey? Uh, honestly, my favorite video. Um, uh, it was on one of the Goldcast things on YouTube, and it was about how it was one of his accepted speeches and how he was asked um, at a very young age who his role model was or who he looks up to, and he said it to myself in 10 years. So mm -hmm. asked me later, uh, and 10 yeah. years later, the same person asked him the same question. He said, I don't know, never met him. He's 10 years away. So he's oh, always constantly wow. working to be better and chasing somebody that, so basically he's chasing his dreams 10 years away and trying to chase mm -hmm. what he wants in life rather than looking at somebody else that who knows what mistakes they've made, who knows what um, problems they have that are underlying, they just put on a face every single day. Mm -hmm. Why put on a face every single day when you can just chase yourself and chase your dreams? Yeah, that's a very interesting perspective I've never seen. I've seen a couple interviews with him, but I haven't seen <coughs> anything um, like that. But that's very introspective, um, very um, self-aware, it seems. He's trying to be on trying to make sure that he's evolving and becoming the best version of himself, for sure. One other person who's a role model that you can look into their leadership vision and see how you can incorporate elements of theirs into yours. I said um, Sadie Robinson because, like, if you watch the show Duck Guy and see, I mean, that was a huge thing, like, you know, eight years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of, like, reality TV show people you see them in real life and they're not very kind and they're just not really actually great people but um, that whole family is based off of like their beliefs and Christianity and um, like she shares a lot in her ministry that I think we can take a lot from um, and just as a person it's like that's someone you want to look up to is someone who is like not just good on camera, but they're a good person in real life too. For sure. So for that last question with the role models that you guys have selected, maybe it's a little bit of help in thinking ahead for your next essay. That role model that you, that leader that you don't know personally, thinking of those elements, kind of like what we just did with Dan West, this is the same kind of exercise, so to speak, that you will be doing as you work through this essay. Okay. So are there any specific questions about this? Personal vision, leadership vision, <coughs> congruency of visions, that language. One thing as a quick refresher, because it talked about it in the film, do you guys, did you guys pick up on any of the um, costs of leadership that it talked about that Dan West struggled from? You guys remember those costs of leadership? There's nine of them, we're not gonna go through all nine. Um, but the things that are challenges for leaders, do you guys remember what they mentioned in the film that related to that concept? 
one of those, two of those, I heard mentioned for sure. Study was always away from his family. Yes, yes. That strain on the family. Well, there was one other I heard them say specifically. It was when they talked to him about um, getting the honor, honorary PhD. Yeah, it would more be like separation. Yeah. yeah, but that's exactly a piece of that example of him saying he didn't want to be separated from the little people. Um, separation, remember, is that concept when you are separated from the rest of the gang because of your leadership role. You maybe can't talk to staff the same way you would be if you were just on the same, um, if you weren't their supervisor and start some of those things. So remember, try to see the connections where you can just to reinforce those concepts we talked about because obviously we'll review before the exam. But these are things you talked about a while ago, but you want to make sure you remember. So before you leave, I do want you guys to bring that worksheet up. I'm going to talk a little bit about next week before you guys go. Um, the Temple Grandin discussion piece should be open now. So let me know before you leave if you don't see it open on there. So Tuesday we will not meet for class face to face, but you will have an assignment that will all be on Canvas. I'll probably make another announcement on Canvas about it um, by Monday so that you guys can see. So the next thing that we'll go into is talking about chapter four. So your quiz will still be due, chapter four quiz will still be due Tuesday, but we'll be getting into Katie Davis. So um, Katie Davis is like a humanitarian who's done a lot of work in Africa, um, and I, I don't want to kind of give away this field, but she will be our leader that will really help you understand values. So chapter four is all, all about values. So for... Tuesday, what you guys will do is that there will be um, about a 30-minute lecture uploaded to Canvas that you guys will need to watch. And then there also will be a YouTube link to a video on Katie Davis. So, Erin, if you can help me pass these out. As you watch this film, you will have this homework assignment that you will need to do that will be due the following Tuesday. Because remember, thir next Thursday we don't meet because of a wellness day. No problem. So I'm not going to go through this assignment kind of with you right now because, like I said, I am going to put up an announcement video that kind of will go in a little bit more detail to make sure it's clear. But you'll want to make sure you read through this. This will be up there on, um, on Canvas. You can submit it via Canvas or you can print it off and bring it when we come back to class the Tuesday after next. But you want to make sure that you're ready to discuss this because we will talk about some of this in class. So whether you need it in front of you, you can pull it up on your phone, whatever. But we are going to, when we, you are watching this film on Katie Davis, you are going to be thinking about her personal vision and her leadership vision. So we're not completely away from that. We're still going to be reinforcing that. But then we're going to look into her five core values. And in Chapter 4, you understand kind of what core values is in reference to this text. And then we're going to look at her motivation to lead. We're going to talk about motivators a little bit in Chapter 4, too. And then, again, looking at congruency of core values and behavior. Because in this class, when we're looking at all these different elements you know, we're wanting congruency. We're wanting kind of who you are on the inside to match what things you um, seek in the future. Because remember, kind of one of those things for a leadership vision is that you want to be authentic in who you are to try to, to build your vision. Any questions about that? So we will not meet face-to-face -face on Tuesday. No face-to-face -face class. But you are expected to look at, the, look at the lecture that will be uploaded onto Canvas and then you are expected to watch the video on Katie Davis and then have this completed. And like I said, this, the deadlines and everything will be up on Canvas, but have this completed by the following Tuesday, which will be the ninth. And will it stay open like the whole time or do we need to watch it on Tuesday? 
it'll stay open. I'll make that live like this weekend. So if you want to get ahead and look at it whenever, you can. You can. But it, it's a Tuesday assignment, so Thursday you don't have anything you're expected to do. So again, remember this weekend I am going to be looking at um, grades and, and making sure kind of everything makes sense in the system as far as points. So again, if you see something flagged in a zero and you have turned it in, maybe shoot me an email and say, hey, I've turned that in. But if you haven't, and, and, and again, as far as excuse, that means like an actual excuse absence. Because if you did miss, you still should have turned it in on the same day, you know, if you took the time to watch the lecture and make sure. So you will receive partial credit in that sense. But if you were quarantined or anything like that, you'll get full credit. So make sure that you take the time before you're asking me what you're all missing or why or where is it that you actually look at the corresponding uh, module because if you don't, then I, then I know you're not looking at that stuff. And I'm like, okay, we got to take some accountability too. So that's the big thing. And then your essay drafts will be due next Thursday. So we will not meet, but those essay drafts are due next Thursday. And then your final essay is due March 9th. So a lot of these things are kind of coming fast, but um, just want to kind of let you know. So on March 9th, we'll go over this. We'll review for the exam March 11th. The following Thursday will be your exam midterm. So we're just chugging along. It's going real fast. <laughs> Any questions before you guys leave? So what do you do on Tuesday? Okay. What else do you watch on Tuesday? Lecture. And then what assignment are you doing on Tuesday? Worksheet. And your quiz. Your quiz for Chapter 4 is due on Tuesday as well. You guys let me know if you have any questions. I will be on campus a little bit on next Thursday if you are around and have any questions. But let me know. And then, again, I'll put up there either an announcement or a post to let you guys know where the can drive, like where the VINs are on the fourth floor. And then, again, I'll work with the committee on kind of getting logistics on maybe someone who can count all the goods that we get just so we have a number for the class at the end of the semester and what we were able to do. And then maybe those people who will deliver it. So that will start the week when we come back face to face. So just be looking out for that. Any questions? Make sure you bring up your Den West worksheets. You guys have a good weekend. I'll see you guys in a bit.